Amen. Well, it's good to see all of you. Um, I was here last Wednesday speaking to you, and we had talked about the truth that faith without works was dead, and we had titled it as Be a Doer, Faith in Action. And so in there, we had explored that we need more than just words, that we must demonstrate it. And we looked at James 2, where James challenged us by asking us, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not work? Can that faith save him? And thus, we talk about being doers of the word. Amen? So now it's part two. In part two, I'm labeling as be a doer, empowered to action. And so I'd like to talk to you a little bit this morning more on the take action part and being empowered to do so. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So a key point is a call to movement. And that movement comes from the Bible where the scripture gives instructions to thank you, arise and go. There's a lot in those few words there. But you can find a couple places in the scripture where this command is repeated, where people are told to arise and go. Where it urges God's people to rise from where they are, and to step into a mission that God has put in front of them. And that this, this commandment is not just about physical movement, but also about spiritual readiness and your willingness to act on the faith that you have. Amen? Amen. Okay, so let's move ahead here and let's turn to a scripture. Let's turn to Luke 17, verse 19. Luke 17, verse 19 says, And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. If you look in the ESV version, it's basically the same thing it says, except for it says, Your faith has made you well. And this passage is from the story of the ten leopards, where um, the ten were healed by Jesus. And they went to go show themselves to the priests, and then one of the lepers came back to Jesus. And we'll talk about that in a second. If you'd like to sit, or you may be seated. Thank you for standing. So in this story of the leopard, um, the Bible doesn't specifically mention where the other nine lepers went after they were healed, right? So... There's 10 lepers. Jesus said, hey, you'll be healed. Go show the priest that you're healed. So we assume that they went to go to the priest to show that they had been healed, right? And so customary, um, as lepers, you weren't going to be allowed to go anywhere. You weren't showing up at Starbucks. You weren't going to the grocery store as a leopard, right? And if you thought you were, all the you know, leprosy had dropped off your body and you were healed, you needed a priest to say so. Right? Society just was not going to bring you back in. So it made sense for Jesus to command them to go see the priest. So I'm assuming they obeyed his instructions, and when they were healed, they went to go show the priest. But the focus of the scripture is on that one leper who returned and expressed his gratitude and thanksgiving to Jesus, and that his return demonstrated his recognition of who the healer was and the faith of who the true Messiah was. And so, in response, the command was rise and go, signifying that maybe something more than just the physical healing had occurred. Right, because the other leopards, they were healed, they went to go show. And so there was a command and a commission that was sent forth here that was empowering that one leopard by his faith for his life to be transformed. So sometimes you might just find yourself with a group of leopards. 
not leopards, lepers. The people, not the animals. But maybe you're all in the same area because you don't want to get others sick. They're hanging out doing leper things. Anyone have a group of your friends that you need to go hang out with when you're in a bad mood? You know what's the worst people to hang out with when you're in a bad mood? Cheerful people. Because sometimes their cheer is contagious. And when you, when you want to be in a bad mood, you can hang around bad people. Right? Yes. Yeah. If you're at work and you want to complain, you don't go complain to the person who has a solution. Right? <laughs> you go complain with everyone else who's complaining about the thing. Right? Sometimes we sit with other lepers. But hey, we're all sinners too, and we're all here, and we're all worshiping together, right? So we can sit in the same pew, and we can feel the same spirit move. We can have the same hand of God come and touch all of our lives. And sometimes we wonder why the leper next to us is receiving the same miracles and blessings as we are. Well, Jesus doesn't discriminate. There was 10 lepers. Healed them all. He didn't sit there and say, hmm, out of these 10 folks, I perceive only one will come back and thank me, so meeny, meeny, I'll pick that one, right? He healed. He did what God does. And so you may experience that everyone around you might receive the same healing, the same blessing, the same goodness, no matter what their station in life is, no matter how holy or unholy they are, right? Right? God's not picking and choosing favorites on how he blesses. He blesses. He pours out his spirit upon just Steve Readout because he's the you know, most specialist person, right? It doesn't, doesn't work that way, right? He pours out his spirit upon all flesh. And so the only thing I'm looking to pull out of this verse here is that distinction that God moves and works everywhere, but there's a key in how you respond that gets you to the next stage of blessing, which gets you to being told to arise and go forth. And that is not just to take the blessing and run and go to Starbucks and finally get your cup of coffee that you couldn't get for the last five years, right? But it's to return back to the person who healed you, to turn back to Jesus and thank him and show him that you understand he's the healer and that he's the most important in in your life. And that's when... He looks at you and he says, arise and go. I have a mission for you. Amen? Amen. Okay. So in all of this, understanding who our identity in Christ is is foundational to living out your faith with confidence and purpose. In Ephesians 1, 3, it beautifully, it beautifully outlines the blessings, the calling, the empowerment, and we're going to read it here. In Ephesians 1, 13, verse 14, it says, In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. So early in this chapter, it began by reminding us that we've all been, say it with me, blessed. Let's try again. Everyone say it with me. Blessed. Blessed. There you go. One more time. Blessed. Blessed. Look at that. (laughs) We're going to do more of that, so we're going to be on it. Um, But it reminded us that we're blessed. And this isn't just about, like, material wealth and success. But it's the guarantee of the inheritance we have in him and the spiritual gifts he's given us. So if we just think to an example of Joseph, right, the son of Jacob, you know, he was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was falsely accused. He was imprisoned. But Joseph remained blessed. It's not the type of blessings I would like, but he was blessed.
In Genesis 39, it says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So after all of that, he's not where he wanted to be. He wasn't home. He wasn't with his people. He was a slave in a different land. But yet, here he is being blessed. Joseph's blessing wasn't in his circumstance, but yet it was in the presence and the favor of God in his life, Amen. which ultimately led him to a position of power where he could save many. I'm going to repeat that. Because it's hit me. Where my blessing isn't in my circumstance, but it's in God's presence and favor. Amen? Amen? So when you find yourself with a bunch of lepers, or you find yourself in a circumstance that might not be exactly what you consider a blessing, it's good to remember your blessing isn't in the circumstance. Your blessing is in God's presence. Amen? So here's Joseph. His life was filled with ups and downs, betrayed, sold slavery, imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit. He must have been feeling abandoned, but Joseph did know something powerful. His true blessing was not where he was at, but who he was with. Yes. Amen. Amen. So as you walk through whatever life throws your way, you hold on to the truth. God's presence in your life is your greatest blessing. That will be your anchor, your hope, and your strength. And if you keep your eyes on him and you trust that his favor will carry you through, it will. Yeah. And we saw that with Joseph. Psalms 84.11 says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk. His blame, and those who walk is blameless. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Many times I have told you or talked to you about one of the, I'll call it a revelation God let me have. I always had that vision of a God with the hammer, right? Well, this scripture is a good revelation that that picture of God with the hammer was false and an idol and something that wasn't God. Right. His plans aren't to hammer you. Right. His plans are to prosper you Thanks. and not to harm you. That's what he would like to do. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. So this verse reminds us that God has a specific plan and a specific purpose for each of you and each of our lives and that his intentions are always for our good. So when you're in that circumstance, remember, yeah, it might be a bad circumstance, but his intentions are for good. His purpose is to bless you. Amen? Amen. God has chosen each one of us for something unique. And with that calling comes a responsibility to live that will in our lives. So let's take a look at the next one, which is chosen. Ephesians 1, 4 says, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Well, you're not here by accident. You've been chosen. You've been chosen with a purpose in mind. There's a reason why you're here. Amen? Consider Moses. We know most of the story about Moses, but you know, God said to Moses, Come and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Well, if you remember, Moses wasn't exactly thrilled about that. He had a laundry list of things of why it shouldn't be him. Right? He wasn't ready for the job. He couldn't speak. He couldn't be the guy that stand out in front. But yet God said, No, no, no. I've chosen you. There's, there's a purpose for you to be there. Amen? that despite his reluctance and his feelings of inadequacy, he was chosen for a design purpose. 
and that we can see in his example that when God chooses you, he will equip you to fulfill his purpose. It doesn't matter what your weakness is, is he's going to equip you. Amen? Amen. So 1 Peter 2.9 declares, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. I'm chosen by God for his purpose. Can you say that with me? I'm chosen by God for his purpose. If you ever thought you didn't have a purpose, you were wrong. You're chosen by God for his purpose. Ephesians 1, 13 tells us that we have been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that that's the guarantee of our inheritance, that the, the, this empowerment is not just a future promise, but a present reality for us, that his Holy Spirit equips us to live out what he wants us to do, yeah. that we have the ability to take action to fulfill the good works that he has prepared for us, and that we're empowered. So... Think about the apostles in the early church. They're a powerful example of what we would call empowerment. You know, they received the the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And these men who were once fearful became fiery arrows for the Lord. Acts 1.8 captures this. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Well, here is Peter. Peter had not been so good. He had did some denying, right? Not exactly who you would think to be a fiery arrow for the Lord. But yet we see that he stood up and he preached with power to about 3,000 people. And we have the scriptures written that have changed the course of the world. Amen? Amen. Amen? 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The spirit that God has given you is not making you timid. So if you have a timid part in your life, if there's something where you're struggling to be able to stand up for what's right, well, that's not the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God has given you power. He's given you love, the ability to love. And the last and hardest one in my book here is he's given you self-discipline. He's given you the power to do what's necessary. He's given you the power over your own self to do the right thing at the right time. Unfortunately to me, that means there's not a cop out for me when I'm feeling tired or just not feeling like doing the right thing because he's, he's given me the strength to do what's necessary. Amen? It'd be nice to skip that one. But next, as we reflect on that, we have our identity in Christ. The scripture said we're blessed, chosen, and empowered. This understanding is not just for our comfort, although it is comforting, but it's also a call to action. Right? If you're blessed, and you're chosen, and you're empowered, well, then you're called to action. Right? Right? If you're in charge of something and you choose someone and you bless them and you empower them, what should they do next? They should do something with it, right? We should take action. Anyone want to volunteer? Anyone? Everyone's scared because of what it is, right? It's simple. I have three things. I can take up to three people. I'll take you, Keegan, Lex, 
Gailey, I'll take you off. Go ahead. Take your pick. I'll climb in this one. There you go. Okay. Sorry, David, I ran out. You can be my helper, though, if you want to come stand next to me. Okay. All I need you guys to do, it's a flashlight, a headlamp, and a portable radio. That's something that catches these signals from the, the air and makes sound. It's really cool. All I need you to do is turn those things on. What's wrong, David? Batteries. Batteries? Oh, you guys need batteries. Wouldn't you know? You know what? Well, I do have a mission for you. I would like for you guys to uh, turn those on. Here's one for you. Here's one for you. I'm coming back for yours, Dave, if you want to bring these to Lex. Do you need help getting that one undone? Yeah, I tightened it. Sorry. These are big. Yeah, these are huge batteries. There you go. Look. Awesome job. Here, let me show everyone. She got it done. Amen. Thank you very much. I don't know what's on there. We're going to be careful what's on there, but I can turn it up and it works. Anyone remember what a radio is? Oh, there was a station, AM. I don't know if they're going to say it, so I'm going to turn it off. But thank you. You got it done. Awesome job. How are you working on it, Lex? Let's see. Yep, they might be in backwards. Let's figure it out. Don't worry. Everyone's just watching you. Take your time. Here, want to help? Uh, yep. I think so. Yep. All the same way. Awesome. Rock on. What do you think, David? Do you think it's going to work? Probably. I think I tested it beforehand. There it is. Look at that. Sweet. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? We turned some things on. Thank you very much. You can, you can be seated. Thank you for helping out. See, that wasn't scary, guys. You can volunteer for my cool things. So what was the point of that? You need some power. I blessed them with some tools. And I wanted them to do something. I gave them a mission. They had a purpose. Their purpose was to turn it on. And nothing was going to turn on until they were empowered. They were given the power, right? But with purpose, with the tools, with empowerment, they got the job done, right? They didn't need much more instructions from me. They knew what to do. When they had a question, they asked, and they got an answer. But they were empowered. And they took action. Amen? Yes. So it's essential to understand that we are not only blessed, but we're chosen. And we're also designed and empowered by God for his purpose. And so this is the last part that I'm going to go through, where each one of us is uniquely crafted by God with a calling that reflects his divine design. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You know, this, view, this verse here captures the essence of our purpose, that we are created with his workmanship. You guys ever been somewhere and said, mm, that's good workmanship? It probably wasn't at, like, Walmart, Right? It's functional, it works. You don't say, hmm, good craftsmanship, right? But you go somewhere where something's nicely designed, right? right? You look and say, wow, there's some craftsmanship there. Someone with skill was there. Right. 
Someone designed it. There's, there's things that were thought of, right. right? Have you ever been in a luxury car? Not yet? Still working on it? Have you ever been in a rental car that was new, yeah. meaning like within the past five years? I've been in one of those. Yeah. It's different than my car. Yeah. <laughs> They've thought of things. They've designed things, right? Some of the best products, you don't even recognize the thought that went into it because it just works and it's just there, right? That's design, right? Someone's put thought into it. There's craftsmanship there. So we are his workmanship. So if you want some boost right now of how great and wonderful you are, this is it. You're his workmanship. So for everything where you feel down about yourself and you mess this up or this and that, just remember, you're his workmanship. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. It means that you were carefully and skillfully crafted by God. Yeah. There's a Greek word here. Starts with a P, ends with an A. I don't speak Greek. Um, it's close to poem with an I in the middle. But it suggests that we are like that. We are like a piece of art. Wow. We are like a poem. We're intentionally designed with care and purpose. Do you guys ever go through in your grade school or high school or college and they made you create a poem? Yeah, I didn't have great workmanship either. I have one. Can't quote it for you. But it meant a lot to me because I probably spent a good week on it. It's only like probably like 10 words. But it fit whatever pattern was there for the poem. And it had the very perfect adjective in each place with each verb right? It was crafted. And so my hope would be that if you read it, you got that same picture, that same feeling, right, that a poem conveys. But it was crafted. It was measured. It wasn't just some words that, you know, you took out a Scrabble bag and threw on the ground, right? It was crafted. It was intentional. We are his workmanship. Psalms 139, 14 says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. You know, you, you, you look at a sculptor chiseling away on whatever this medium it was, stone, rock, marble, wood, right? And they're taking those little pieces apart. And you can't see what, what's in their head, but they do. That's craftsmanship. That's design. That's very carefully going through. Amen? So thus we are created in Christ. Our, our purpose and our identity, it's rooted in him. That being created in Christ means our new life and our new purpose is through our relationship with him. And that your purpose and your abilities are not your self-made ones, but they're given to you through your connection with him. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. Just as that vine is connected down and it draws all that life and that nourishment from that branch, we also draw our purpose and our strength and our nourishment from Christ. Yeah. And that without him, you're not going to fulfill a purpose. You'll be unfulfilled. doesn't matter what you're seeking or where you go or how successful you come, you will not fulfill what his creation was intended. You have to be connected with him. Amen? And we're created for good works. It says we are designed with the purpose to do good works, meaning actions that reflect God's love, his mercy, his justice in the world, which means your works aren't just random acts. They're meaningful contributions to God's plan. So if we consider the specific talents and passions you have, and if you say you're talentless, you're wrong. But you have some natural ability for something. That might be a good clue to one of the things that God has prepared to use. And that you should reflect on how God wants to use you. Amen? Amen. Matthew 5.16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Right. So when someone sees your good deeds, what is the purpose? 
Glorify God. See God. You know what's really cool? Is they still saw your good deeds. Am I the only one that's like, sweet, they saw a good deed. I was associated with it. I'd much rather be associated with the good things right. Right, than the bad. Right. But yeah, but the purpose is, yeah, you saw the good deed, but <clears throat> glory is for him. Amen? Right. Think about the parable of the talents. It's in Matthew somewhere, um, where the servants are all given different amounts of talents, right? And each one is expected to use that talent for something, to get good results, and we know the story, the one with so much made so much, the other one with so much made so much, and you got down to the guy who had one and he buried it and did nothing. And he, he was very happy with him. So look, I preserved it, and it was so good. It's just as you gave it to me, minus this little bit of dirt, right? And we know the response of that master was like, uh-uh. That's not why I gave you a talent. I didn't give you things for you to not use it, Right? I gave you something, and I empowered you with it so you could go produce, and you could do my purpose, and you could do my will. Amen? So the next part of the scripture was, which God had prepared beforehand. So God had already planned things. He already has good works to do. So if you're someone who's out there saying, well, I'd love to do something, I just don't know what to do. Well, good news for you. It fulfills my need to know what the agenda is. It fulfills my need to know what my next step is. Is He already has a plan. And you can read in the Bible and you can read the book and you'll get commands of what he's going to tell you to do. He's going to tell you to arise and go. He's going to give you purpose and mission. Amen? Anyone counting how many AMs, amens I'm on? No? Okay. I'll know I've reached my status when people start counting because that's what I did when I was a kid. I knew people's key words and I counted them. So for any of the young kids that have a struggle just paying attention, that was my trick. Amen? But we can trust that God has a plan for your life, which includes good works for you to do. And you can seek his guidance through prayer and seek it through reading the Bible to discover what that is. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the, the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Any gardeners? Yes? No, Sister Kale's a couple of us. Um, when you have a garden, does it just happen? No. I thought it did. You just go like this with the seeds, and it happens. <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? No, but when you have a garden, you have to plan. So imagine that, guard, that gardener who, who plans in advance. He, he's carefully selecting the type of plants, where to put them, which ones to associate with, how much shade, how much water, what goes well. I can't tell you how many conversations I hear from my wife with other folks like Sherry, and they talk about plants, and names are flying this way and that way. Like, I have no clue. They're green, they grow. Right? Yep. Weeds and flowers, same thing. Anything in the path of my mower, all gets chopped down. <laughs> right? A gardener has a different design. Yep. Right. Knows how to organize so that they grow, and they're fruitful, and they multiply just enough, unless you're mint. And then mint's a different story. I've learned that. Next part of the scripture says that we should walk in them. And walk in them suggests ongoing active participation in those good works. Yes, being a part of it. Being with them. That it's not just that one-time event. Right? Not to just do your one good thing for the year and call it a day. Right? But to have it be an active part of your life. That you live daily with the intention of fulfilling what God has for you to do, and that you're proactive and you're intentional in doing good, that you seek opportunities to serve, and that you act in alignment with his will. Amen? Amen. Another one. James 1, 22. Do not merely listen to the word 
and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's not the King James, is it? For those human track, that's, that's the NIV, but I like that version because it's, it's plain. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Yeah. Amen. Amen. So let's summarize these things, being created in Christ here. You are God's masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus with a purpose. To do good works that he has already planned for you. That that's your identity. And it's up to you to walk that daily. Amen? Does it feel cool to be a masterpiece? Sometimes I think you need to remind yourself with all your flaws and everything that goes on that you tend to let just bombard your brain and occupy you, sometimes it's good to step back and say, wait a second. The master's still working on me. You know that sharp block? that was He just knocked that off. Right. Look a little bit better. He's still working. I'm a masterpiece. Amen? Amen. I'm created for good works. I might have messed up, but I'm created to do good. So why don't I do it? Let's go do something. He's already prepared a way. He's already made opportunities for you to do good. They're right in front of you. That's right. You're going to see it every day. There's going to be an opportunity for you to choose right. There's going to be an opportunity for you to help. There's going to be an opportunity for you to share God's love with someone else. And because of all that, because that way is prepared, I'm going to do it. I'm going to walk in it. Amen? Yes. Amen. Amen. So Psalms 139, 13 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. David's acknowledging that every part of him was crafted by God, even before he was born. And this, this truth applies to us as well. Not only are you wonderful made, but God's design for you is intentional. Amen. Do you think I'm hammering the same message over and over? You're right. Yes. I am. Not only has God designed us, but he's also empowered us to carry out the good works. And empowerment comes through the Holy Spirit, which guides us, strengthens us, and equips us. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We just read this. It's coming back up because this is the promise to his disciples that they would get the power they needed to do the mission in front of them. Yeah. And this empowerment wasn't just for that early church. It wasn't just for those disciples. It wasn't just for the day of Pentecost. But it's for all believers. It's for all those that will receive his spirit. Gideon's a good example of someone who was empowered by God to fulfill the purpose. Do you remember the story of Gideon? Um, Gideon saw himself as the least of his family. But God called him a mighty warrior. Gideon was an ordinary man. He was living in a time when Israel was oppressed by the Midianites. They were suffering greatly, and they had cried out to God for help. So here we have Gideon one, Gideon one day. He's secretly threshing wheat, right? He's in secret. He's hiding from the Midianites, and he's throwing his wheat up, just trying to get some, some wheat, something probably to feed his family. He's in hiding. He's not bold. He's not courageous. He's not there declaring, this is the day of the Lord and this is my wheat which I shall eat. No, he's hiding, going, oh my word, I just need a little bit, right? So Gideon, however doubtful or unsure he was of himself, you know, questioning God of why are we suffering, not sure what's going on. Well, Gideon was in his circumstances and he wasn't yet in his blessing, shall we say. 
But despite his doubts, God assured him that he would be with them and that Gideon would lead them to victory. And you know the story. He was empowered by God. God took a small army of just 300 men, told him how to select them, told him who he needed to get, told him how to fight with the trumpets, with the light, the jars. And those 300 men changed the course of history. Because Gideon got out of his circumstance, looked to his blessing, took the empowerment of God and acted and went forth. Amen? Amen. Despite his fears, Gideon was empowered to accomplish what seemed impossible. And so as God's workmanship here, our actions should also or should always align with the purpose God's placed inside of you. What we do should reflect him. Amen? Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We're encouraged here that in everything we do, it should reflect our relationship with the Lord. Our actions, whether they're big or whether they're small, should glorify God. Amen? Amen. If we look at Esther, I won't go through the full story there, but she's an example of someone whose actions reflected God's design for her life. She was placed in a royal position for a time like this. Right place, right time, right purpose, right alignment with God. And when her time came, she was courageous, and she acted such to save her people. She stepped into her purpose that God had for her. So we've gone through all that. Just remind you that you do have a purpose. Um, If you think about it, if you guys know like the SEAL team, the Navy SEAL team, I forget how many are in there. Four, five, six, I forget the number. But each one of them has a specific purpose, a skill set that they specialize in, and they're on that team for a reason. And so when that team goes out to perform a mission, they're all in. They're all dialed in. They know their part of the mission. They know their skill set, and they go and they execute. Many, many different organizations that are very successful that you look in, it's the same thing. Whether it's some fraternity or some social group that have achieved great success, you see the same thing. People with different abilities use the right way for the success of the whole. Have anyone watched the Amish raise a barn? How on earth do you build a barn in 24 hours? I don't know. You could give me 100 people. I don't know how to do it. In fact, I see some of the construction projects we do around here. We can't build a shed in a day. It just doesn't happen. But the Amish, they all show up, and by the end of the day, there's a new barn. A good barn, a sturdy barn, solid and dependable. Because there's people with purpose that know their skill set and everyone has their part to do. Amen? Amen. So the Lord has brought us together as well. So whatever skill you have, it's a skill we need. I'll say it again. Whatever skill you have is a skill we need because God has brought you here. We are his workmanship created for good works, designed and empowered to fulfill his purpose. So Matthew 28, 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. We know this as the Great Commission. Clear, powerful, 
call to action for each and every one of us. Any believer has this call. Jesus didn't suggest that we make disciples. He commanded it. He gave a charge to each one of us. The commission is not just limited to pastors or missionaries or church leaders or the person over there, the person that was good at it, right? But it's a charge to each of us. It's about actively engaging in this mission. I think I started Wednesday, I know I started Wednesday, talking about Dr. Martin Luther King and his uh, quote about the consciousness of the state, that the church is the consciousness of the state. And urging to guide and critique societal, societal norms rather than just to conform to it. Yeah. We are to stand firm on the word of God yeah. and not conform. What's right is right. And what's wrong is wrong. So in the same way, the Great Commission is that call for us to be that voice for our community, in our circles, in our families. And that the world needs believers who are willing to step out, to speak out, and to take action. Amen. And again, I'm not saying let's all go walk around with our picket signs, right? I'm not a social organizer like that, but I'm suggesting wherever you are, your picket sign should be clearly in your life. That here's what's right. I stand for yeah. Jesus Christ. The Bible has dominion in my life. Amen? Amen. Um, last Wednesday after I was done, pastor called us all up, told us some things, right? Observations. And what I'd say, and I have like this much experience in leading people, but what I saw in that meeting was empowerment, yeah. right? First, he provided self-awareness, right? right? Hey, this is something we need to be aware of. Two, he provided some resources by just simple examples of what was needed, he promoted decision-making skills. Listen, when you see this, make a decision. When you see that, make a decision. Be aware, right? Yeah. He encouraged all of us to grow in our mindset. Let's think. Let's observe and let's take action. Amen. Let's improve. Yeah. He set a goal. Yeah. Let's make sure we're a nice, welcoming community. Yes, sir. And then he fostered independence. You're responsible. You're responsible for you and how you act, right? And I mentioned those key six things because those are all attributes of a leader who empowers a team, right? Because sometimes, and I'm speaking for myself, sometimes we sit here and we're paralyzed waiting for permission to do the right thing, right? And maybe it's because we've been told no before, maybe twice before, three times before. I had, as in a position... And there was this app we needed to build to solve the solution. I don't go into details, but I had proposed it. No. Well, that was the right thing to do. Another four months, someone says, hey, this is all broken. We need to fix this. Blah, blah, blah. I say, I got the solution. It's right here. No. I did that for two years. And then I grew bitter. And I didn't do it anymore. And so if they're sitting with a new boss at a new time, and he was doing this to me again, here's this problem, we need to solve it, yada, 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 and I stayed silent. And he's asking, and he's pressing, and finally said, Steve, do you know what to do? And I was like, yeah, but we're not going to do it. <laughs> I'm a great employee. And he pressed me, he's like, what do you mean? I was like, well, I'm not, even, I'm not bothering my time. I have a problem, right? I'm not bothering my time telling you what to do or how to solve it. I've been here for too long. I know this place. We're not going to do it. It's not going to work. And he looked at me and said, why? I'm like, well, I've just been told no. He's like, well, did you ask again? And I was like, well, maybe that's why you're the manager, because you have great wisdom. And the fact is, yeah, we have new leadership. It's a new chain of command. It's a different time. We actually have budget. The problem's ready for the solution that I was thinking of. And he said, well, go ask again. And I asked again. And it was the right time. It was the right place with the right budget 
with the right people, with the right support, and boom, we had a yes. Right? So I say all that to say sometimes we have a great commission in front of us. And sometimes we're just waiting. We're paralyzed, not ready to take that action just because we have something inside of us, not ready to ask or not ready to say hi or not ready to do that. And so my plea with you today is to take that action, to let you know you're empowered, that there's nothing stopping you. You have the Spirit of God that is guiding you to do what's needed. Amen? Amen. So as we bring this to a close, I challenge you to take that action, to let your faith be the demonstration through works. Not just to hear the word, but to do it. To ask God to strengthen you and give you the courage to live that out in your life. Yeah. Whatever area it is. And I encourage you to trust that as you do step out, that he will be with you. Yeah. He'll be guiding you. He'll be empowering you. Amen? Yeah, amen. And that you will make a difference in this world. So as you stand, I'll kindly just remind you and ask you to remember that you are blessed, you are chosen, you have a purpose, and you're empowered to do it. That God has prepared good works for you. And he wants you to do those and walk in it. Amen. And so he's given you a command this morning to arise and go and to fulfill the mission that is set in front of you. Amen? Amen. So I hope you're encouraged. This message is to empower you, not me. I have no power, right? But to encourage you that God has empowered you to go forth that there's no reason for you to wait on the call that God's put on your life. Right. Yeah. 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 Amen. That he's working on your heart this morning to remind you of that call. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Amen. If you'd like to close your eyes, I'll open the altar here if you'd like to come and pray. God has a purpose for you that he would like you to do. That he has been preparing you all these years. That maybe you just haven't felt it yet. You didn't felt prepared. You didn't felt the door was open. But he's opening it for you. And he's giving you that gentle nudge to go through. And if you need it, he'll give you the firm kick to go through as well. But he's encouraging you tonight to open up your hearts to him, to let you know that he's got control. He's designed you. He's got a path in front of you. You might not see it all, but he does. And that you don't need to worry, you don't need to fear, because he has you. And he loves you. And he wants you to arise and go to be fulfilled in the purpose he has in front of you. Amen.